John chapter 13, if you would please, in your Bibles. As you are turning to John 13 over the next several weeks, we will see that Jesus, in his last encounter with the disciples, gave us the central message of what his ministry and the Christian faith would be all about. I'm going to read verses 1 and following and ask you to join me. And as I read, I'm going to give you a doctrinal or a truth that is revealed in that verse. And over the next several weeks, we're going to actually build upon that. John 13, notice if you would please. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that he should depart from this world to the Father, and I would write the word deity in the margin of your Bible. May not seem important, but the Christian faith is not based on the love of a man. It is not based on the teachings of a man. It is based on the love of God, and it is based on the truth of God coming himself to deal personally with the judgment that sin brought on the world. Notice, if you would please, verse 1 continues. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And I would write by those words, charity. The definition of love is not God ignoring our sin. It is God dealing with our sin. I'm going to spend a great deal of time today dealing with what's happened to the American church. And I think as I unfold for you what has gone on, you will agree that by and large, the church has gone in exactly the direction we will look at. But we have lost the central message, by and large, of the Christian faith. And that involves God dealing with the problem of humanity needing cleansing. Verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, verse 4, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. I would write the word humility. None of us would expect God stooping. But the truth of the matter is, that is a central reality in Christianity. Not as much as us becoming like God, but even more so, God choosing to become man and humbling himself to die for us. Verse 7. I'm sorry, verse 6. Then Simon Peter, th then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And I would write the word mystery. Much of what God is doing now, we do not understand. God's plan is to act in our lives and then explain 
tomorrow or even in eternity as we will see in the weeks to come. Notice, if you will, please, verse 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, and notice he didn't say your feet. Peter had his feet washed and Judas had his feet washed. Judas went to hell. Peter went to heaven. This is not primarily about foot washing. Jesus is, if I may put it this way, giving the disciples the final illustration of what he's all about. This is an object lesson, we would call it today. And it is primarily about purity. Jesus said very clearly, verse 8, if I do not wash you, you have no participation, no relationship with me. The important lesson, every one of us this morning in this room has either been cleansed by Jesus Christ or needs cleansing by Jesus Christ. We cannot be cleansed by another and we cannot cleanse ourselves. Notice, if you would, please, the Bible tells us Peter's response. Peter said to him, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And what a wonderful response to realizing what Jesus is saying. Nothing held out, nothing held back, nothing covered, everything right there, Lord. I need it desperately. Notice, if you would please, Jesus speaks. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed, which is a reference to salvation, needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you were clean, but not every one of you. I know our Bibles read all of you, but all of you does not mean all of you. It literally means all of you, because Jesus knew Judas was there. Listen carefully as the text goes on. Verse 11, he clarifies, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. And now you come to verse number 11, apostasy. Yesterday afternoon, a neighbor came to our home. We were talking in the backyard and the subject of a tragic experience in a local family came up. And the neighbor said of the family where the tragedy had occurred, he lost his Christianity. And my thought immediately in my mind was, knowing his background, did he really ever have biblical Christianity? Because Christianity is not praying a prayer. It is not agreeing with three or four verses. It is not walking an aisle. It is not making a decision. Christianity is coming to Jesus Christ in whatever format that happens. The true Christian has had an encounter with Christ and been cleansed by Christ. I said to my wife as we reflected upon that this morning, writing to the service, what concerns me so much today is we have reduced salvation to a formula. And because you follow the formula, we guarantee you're saved. I have some bad news for you. We can't guarantee anything. It's not in our realm. What God is doing, he is doing within the man, within the woman, within the young person, within the child. And we are sideline observers and not always sure what's going on. Humility is required. 
Notice verse number 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. Verse 14, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, You also ought to wash one another's feet. And Jesus just defined ministry and what it's all about in the church. It's not abnormal for every one of us to walk in the doors. Having been in this godless world, our minds constantly flooded with all kinds of evil thoughts, all kinds of evil motivations, all kinds of advertising, all kinds of influences. And sometimes we feel like, I feel so dirty. It's normal to walk in the doors and know that we've been touched by the world outwardly and to want to be cleansed from that. And Jesus tells us that's what the fellowship is all about. Our mutual interaction and involvement with one another ought to enable us to leave here clean through the word that he has spoken. I'd like to begin this morning by taking a little walk of what is going on in the American church. We are not living in the same church that Peter and the apostles were in. Oh, theologically, if we know Christ as Savior, we are. But culturally, we are not. There are people who look at the church in America, and they would say, I think that the church is doing wonderful. Let me give you some amazing statistics. Those who are experts in the field, and there are a number who really are, tell us that the majority of Americans have never been churched. The number of people in America who've been churched has always been a minority. In fact, a radical minority. I can remember in 1976, we boasted that America had finally reached the place that we were now looking at potentially 50% of America as churched. And then they began to study the numbers and they found that the number of people professing to be homosexuals were larger than the number of true believers. In 1776, the average church in America only had 76 people attending. In 1900, that number had finally increased to 91. In 1805, just before we had the war with Great Britain, the War of 1812, 7% of America was churched. By 1880, only 15% of America was churched. And that 15% came with a shift that was brought into the church by an evangelist who shifted the church from being didactic teaching to dramatic. We have never recovered. What was begun by him has been the trend now for 200 years and has reshaped the church in America. Today we find ourselves cranking along just fine, whether we're conservative or liberal, whether we're evangelical or mainline Protestant, whether we're Catholic, emergent, or new age. The church finds herself saying, we're doing a pretty good job. Don't bother us. In the midst of all the success that we are enjoying, we find ourselves extremely busy, and it's not an accident that I've chosen this particular picture. We find ourselves busy being culturally relevant. We've improved our business practices. We are celebrating recovery. We are now user-friendly, we are techno-savvy, we are purpose-driven, we're fighting for peace and justice, our uh, our envy is spiritual formation, 
We're teaching people to grow in self-esteem, and we have reinvented the ecclesiastic tycoon so that we all feel great. There's just one thing missing in the picture. Something missing? Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesus Christ. Modern Christianity is not about the Lord Jesus Christ. It might be about the Christian, but it is not about Jesus Christ. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 1. In our obsession to be practical, relevant, helpful, and successful, we've not only lost our mission, we've lost our moorings, and we have lost our message. Because the truth of the matter, our concern is too often to mirror our culture. Liberals pioneered for us an understanding that salvation doesn't need Jesus Christ. Salvation comes by personal application and personal decision-making and personal surrender and personal commitment. And the result is now that a Muslim is saved, a Hindu is saved, a Jew is saved, and they all reject Jesus Christ. And we ask ourselves the question, what happened? What happened was the evangelical church shifted the moorings. The Bible tells us that when the enemy comes in like a flood, that God will lift up a standard. The standard God lifts up is always his word. It's his authoritative truth. It is the only means by which we can get back to what we ought to be. We never thought that we'd see a time that evangelicals would join Hindus and Muslims and Jews for public prayer, but not public prayer in Jesus' name. Think that through. Jesus said, if we come to the Father, we must come to the Father in him. Only one possibility of man coming to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, Jesus said. That was our historic message. But now Jesus Christ is reduced to being nothing more than one prop in the great play of the modern church. And the church and its success becomes the key concern. The great tragedy is this. Apart from packaging, most of what we're hearing today can be satisfied by secular psychology and self-help groups. It's about me. It's about us. It's about my struggles. It's about my problem. And the truth of the matter is, it's about my sin. Jesus Christ did not come to give us a better self-image. I'm not saying that God doesn't help us to have a better self-image. I'm saying that's not the purpose of the incarnation. Jesus Christ did not come primarily to help us with our personal bad habits, to find deliverance and to find freedom from those habits. Jesus Christ came because the Bible tells us the wrath of God abides on those who do not believe. His primary reason for coming is that man is in... Uh, receipt of and deserving of the just judgment of Almighty God. The soul that sins, it shall die. And the tragedy is that the reality of hell and the need of the gospel and the incarnation of Jesus Christ have been sidelined in the midst of all that is going on. Without a clear foundation of God being absolutely, perfectly holy. Without a reality of God hating sin, there is absolutely no need for a gospel, no need for an incarnation, no need for a crucifixion. The central message of Christianity was very simple and very basic. Man is deserving God's judgment, and Christ came to bear God's judgment in order that God might be free to forgive sins of those who come to Jesus Christ. 
The result today is the gospel has been trivialized. God has been transformed into a product that we sell. Faith is nothing more than recreation and amusement in the church, and the church is reduced to nothing more than a social club of people who like each other. Gallup pollsters did a study of the American Evangelical Church. They asked questions concerning the faith to test who really is a part of the classic, as it's been defined for 70 years, evangelical church. And they concluded, this is the Gallup pollsters, 32% of adult Americans are evangelical Christians. But then when they began to ask probing questions of what that really meant, they reduced the number to 8%. David Wells is a theology professor at Gordon-Conwell Seminary. It is not a fundamentalist school. It is a good school, but it is only evangelical. David Conwell, I'm sorry, David Wells has written the books, No Place for Truth, The Courage to be Protestant, and God in a Wasteland, and a number of others. In studying their research, David Wells said this, Based on the ongoing research, my guess is that the figure is not 8%, but only 2%. We are living in a fool's paradise. One writer stated the following, Evangelicals have too long loved being in their popularity role. It started to alarm the media, it created heartburn in mainline denominations, and it has created power-mongering among those who are evangelicals. But it may all turn out, listen carefully, but it may all turn out to be nothing more than an optical illusion because the face is nothing more than a plague of nominal evangelicalism as trite and superficial as Catholic Europe. Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Washington Week was asked to write an article on the Church of Scientology. They stated, and I quote, the difference between a cult and a religion is only a hundred years. More startling than their words was the response of the evangelicals individually, collectively, denominationally. They were angered that the newspaper would equate both in any way and insisted that the argument they were making could not be true. The church is truly the church even when it includes the cults. Take your Bible for a moment and turn to 1 John chapter 4. First John 4, notice if you would please, beginning at verse 1. John warns us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Pause for a moment. Just because it is a spiritual experience, does not mean it is the Holy Spirit. There are emotional spirits and there are demonic spirits. And the believer understands that we're not looking for a spiritual experience. We're looking for a biblical experience, a Christ-centered experience, a God-focused experience. And John warns us of the danger. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. 
And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. If those words are true, and they are, that means that when a Mormon tells me that Jesus Christ and I are on the same level, I automatically understand my understanding of Mormonism. That means when a Jehovah Witness tells me that Jesus Christ is the brother of Lucifer and he's nothing more than an angel, I know exactly what I'm dealing with. That means when I am told by Islam that Jesus Christ could never have been born of the virgin and that Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh, I realize that Islam is wrong. And the same would be true of Judaism. That's what broke Christianity from Judaism was the deity of Jesus Christ. That was the test question in the early church. John even went so far in 2 John to say that if someone comes to your door and doesn't bring this doctrine, he didn't discuss a hundred doctrines, he didn't discuss 20 doctrines, he reduced it to one doctrine. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? That became the test question for the early church and it settled everything. What has happened in the American church is summarized so well by Aldous Huxley in his classic, Brave New World. He makes a biblical point when he states the following. When a society finds itself relaxing and enjoying itself, even laughing in the center of what they call the truth, they have stopped thinking. Erwin Lutzer said it this way, I have no fear that the church will succeed. My only fear is, will it succeed at what does not matter? I'm convinced there are three things that have actually affected the church. And those three things are very simply these. I'll list them and take a moment to talk about them and then show you why this is important with the text. Number one, aside from packaging, little that is going on in the church today could be classified as doctrinal. Most of it is psychological. Larry Crabb, Christian psychologist, I may not agree with everything he says, but in his book, Finding God in the Midst of His Problems, of Our Problems, he says, and I quote, As never before, the church is aware that its people are in pain, but this sensitivity has backfired. Rather than drawing closer to God, we long to feel better about ourselves. God seems to exist in the wings, waiting for his cue to heal our hurts, to solve our problems. We are not learning to worship God, but we're learning to embrace our inner child, to heal our memories, to overcome our addictions, to deal with our depressions, to improve our self-image, to replace self-hate with self-love, to swap shame for affirmation. Feeling better has become more important than finding God. God is used as a means to an end. He is not the ultimate objective of the church today. I know someone who attended our church, and when she began to attend, I sat down with her and I talked with her about her own spiritual condition. And she responded with these words. She said, I am not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. That statement exhibits a shift in the American culture. Not a religious person, just a spiritual person. Because in reality, what has happened is experience has become more important than God. It doesn't matter if it's a psychological experience, if it's an emotional experience, if it's a demonic experience, if it's a new age experience, experience is God. And I thought only God was God. God is spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is why historically Protestant churches have made preaching the center of their worship experience. Because everything we know authoritatively about God is reduced 
to what this book teaches. And it becomes the rose-colored glasses through which we view everything else, or better yet, the microscope through which we examine everything. Nothing else is as important as what does the text say about truth and life. And when I come to John chapter 13, Jesus Christ looks at the modern church and he says to the modern church, have you lost your way? Do you really know what your message is? Turn back to John chapter 13, if you would, please. John 13, notice if you would please, John 13, verse 1, and then the end of verse number 3. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, and I'll pick up tonight the rest of that verse. Drop down to verse number three. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. And you come to the very central reality, the cornerstone of the Christian faith. We call it the Christian faith because the center of what we preach is who Christ is and what Christ did. In other words, the message of Christianity is not what kind of Christian I am. It's what kind of Christ I have. The message of Christianity is not striving to be a better Christian. Oh, that's important. Don't misunderstand me. But that's not our central message. Our central message is very simply that Christ is God in the flesh who came to this world to die on the cross and suffer the wrath of God that I might receive the forgiveness of sins. That may seem like a trite old message, but I assure you it is not a message humanity wants to receive. The natural inclination of man is everywhere in my life. I have strived to be approved. I did it with my family. I did it on my first job. I did it with my friends and my neighbors. I do it in my own home now. I did it in school. My life is all about me proving how worthy I am. And the central message of Christianity begins with one very simple reality. I abandon all hope in myself. I am not worthy. I am not worthy of the least of these, your mercy. A man comes to God Almighty and he recognizes before God Almighty, like Ruth recognized before the kinsman redeemer Boaz, who am I that thou shouldst take note of me? It's like the psalmist who cried in Psalm 8. I look at the heavens, the stars, and the moon, and I ask the question, what is man that you are mindful of him? In order to be cleansed, a man has to recognize he deserves to be judged. Now, that doesn't fit well in America. We'd like to talk about the love of God without the justice of God. We'd like to talk about the love of God without the cross. We'd like to talk about the love of God without hell. But I'm here to tell you this morning, there is no need for the love of God as revealed in the Bible without hell. It's just that simple. As I pick the Bible up, I come to a realization that what Jesus Christ is doing is he is illustrating what is the purpose of his coming. Notice some words this morning in John chapter 13. Would you please take your Bible and look with me at verse 4 and listen carefully. The Bible says in verse 4 that he rose from supper laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet 
and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Would you underline these words in verse 4? Laid aside his garments. Why was it critical in this last object lesson that the Son of God was to give? That he purposely took a basin, a pitcher of water, and a towel to illustrate why he came. It is an illustration of God becoming man in order for cleansing to take place. Take your Bible and go back just a very few pages to John chapter 10. Remember those words I just read? He laid aside his garments. Those words, if I may say this from a poetic standpoint, become a play on the words that he stated in John 10. Listen carefully to John 10, beginning at verse 17. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Note those words, I lay down my life. Verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I voluntarily, by an act of the will, choose to underline the words, lay it down of myself. I have authority or power to lay it down, and I have authority or power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. The message of the Christian faith begins with the fact that God became man and he took a robe on. The robe that he took on was not a towel. It was his flesh. People often talk about when God became man, Jesus Christ gave up. Jesus Christ didn't give up anything. He did give up public expression, but he did not reduce himself to less than God. Nathaniel, I saw you under the tree before you came. Son, they've run out of water at the, we at the wedding. Whatever my son tells you to do, do it. And Jesus Christ spoke the words, and water became oinos, wine. He comes to the graveside of Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth! Who can give life but God? God only. Who can forgive sins but God only? He didn't cease to be God. He chose, like the towel, to hide who he was. Because humanity was not looking for God, the deliverer, the deliverer from sin. Until he died, no price is paid. Many of us have been taught that New Testament begins with Matthew 1. It does not. It doesn't begin with Mark 1. It doesn't begin with Luke 1. It doesn't begin with John 1. Oh, they're placed in the New Testament, but the New Testament required the blood. And the blood was not shed until Matthew 26, until Mark 15, until Luke 23, and until John 19. Most of what we call the Gospels is really Old Testament. I know preachers that can't make the distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament because they put the Gospels as New Testament and they end up with all kinds of errors. Jesus Christ came with one purpose. To give his life for the sheep. That was his only reason for becoming man. You see, in the days of the New Testament... People didn't wear shoes, they wore sandals, or even went barefoot. In the days of the New Testament, you didn't have sidewalks. You didn't have pavement. You had dusty roads. And so Jesus Christ says, I'm going to illustrate why I've come into the world, and I'm going to use the problem of dirty feet. 
to illustrate dirty humanity, dirty hearts. You see, the truth of the matter is, in a Jewish home, it had become customary by the time that Jesus comes on the scene historically, every family would have by the door a basin of water. That basin of water was for a guest to wash their feet because those dusty roads caused the feet to become dirty and they were in need of cleansing. Very interestingly, do you know that no Jew who was a master of a house, a mistress of a house, would ever wash feet? Do you realize that a Jew would never have their Jewish slave wash your feet? Washing feet was reserved only for those Gentile dogs, unworthy of the time of day of life itself. They were the ones who would wash feet. It illustrated for us, as well as the disciples, the depths of degradation to which Jesus Christ was willing to stoop in order to deal with the problem of sin. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Never in ourselves, in him. No hope in ourselves, in him. No security in ourselves, in him. No rest in ourselves, in him. I'm amazed at how many times we are so proud of ourselves because we have come to Christ. I'll tell you right now, if you came to Christ and you're not there because God brought you and you didn't realize you needed it until God showed you, and since he showed you, you've been humbled by it, I'm not sure you've ever been to Calvary. I'm not sure you've come to Jesus. The Christian life begins with humility, which is what this teaches us. And in humility, we discover God's charity and experience God's purity. F.B. Meyer stated it as is written on the screen, and that's part of the quote. F.B. Meyer said it this way. He said, he laid aside the garments of light which he had worn as his vesture. He took up the towel of humanity, wrapped it about his glorious person, poured his own blood into the basin of the cross, and set himself to wash away the foul stains of human depravity and guilt. Simply put, he laid aside the visible manifestation of all he is, and not to benefit himself, but to accomplish the work of forgiveness. The Bible clearly states this in Philippians 2, and I'd like to ask you to turn with me there. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, beginning at verse 5, Paul is telling the church at Philippi, what is the secret of unity? It is not agreement. It isn't the same basic attitude, perspective, opinion about everything. It's really very simply one principle. Principle of genuine humility. We often as individuals think too highly of ourselves. A husband and wife have a disagreement. What's the cause of the disagreement? Well, he was wrong. She was wrong. He was right. She was right. No. Pride of opinion. Human pride. It's always that. Go back to the first sin that was ever committed. Was Adam's first sin drunkenness? No. Immorality? No. Adam's first sin was too proud to submit to the truth of God in light of the invitation of his wife. And because of his pride, humanity fell. Thomas Manton said it this way, Pride turned angels into demons, and man into a sinner. 
And so we come to Philippians 2, and Paul tells us in Philippians 2, the greatest illustration of humility is seen in Jesus Christ. I will translate some words more closely to the original language, so occasionally I will change a word. Verse 5, let this mindset, this attitude, this way of thinking be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the essence of deity, being in the form of God, did not consider it something to be grasped after, like robbery, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant, of a bondservant, a servant by choice, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is God, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The purpose of the incarnation, the purpose of Christmas is Easter. We don't celebrate the birth of a child. We are technically celebrating the death of the God-man. All of the scriptural message is about his death for our sins. In the days in which these words were, wrote, were, were, were written, a Roman centurion is leading his soldiers into battle. A Roman centurion recognizing the power of his death and its effect on the army would take his helmet, his other symbols, and put them aside in order that he would not be recognized. He did not cease to be a centurion. He only removed the emblems that publicly confirmed he was a centurion. His insignia was removed, not his personhood. Pick the Bible up, and what the Bible is telling me is that Jesus Christ came into this world incognito. His goal was to live for 33 years not to prove that he could just live with humanity, but to deal with human filth. To find out what it's like to trudge this filthy world and not be dealing with the dust of the earth, but with the wickedness of mankind. The wickedness that we still possess, even if we know Christ as Savior. We deal with it often. And his purpose was one thing to go to the cross, the most shameful kind of death that a man could experience in the days of the New Testament. He died as a criminal, though he was not a criminal. He was crucified between two thieves. And even at his death, one thief said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. A Roman centurion looked at the same scene and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. In both cases, God revealed himself to them so they recognized what was going on. They didn't just see a physical experience. They saw the eternal battle of all of the ages taking place. And Jesus Christ is now laying the groundwork, the preparation for the battle of the ages to take place. So that when his disciples experience what is about to take place, they recognize it's much more than the Romans and the Jews and the present tense and the physical. It's God providing a sacrifice for our sin. I close with these words from Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray and the Lord laid on him 
iniquity of us all. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 10 tells us this. He will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. The wrath of God was satisfied by the death of Jesus Christ. As eternal God, he offered an eternal an immutable, an infinite, an unending sacrifice so that you and I can have forgiveness of sin. My question this morning to you would be, have you experienced forgiveness of sin? Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Father, as we come to you today, We realize that any time there is a public gathering of people, it's normal in our assumption that if it's a church gathering, surely most of us know Christ as our personal Savior. But Father, it's so easy for us today because our minds are flooded with regular services, unlike the days of the New Testament television, radio, books, tracks, so much intercommunication between people. Because we hear these things echoed time and time again, it's so easy to assume we have it simply because we acknowledge the facts. Help us to realize there is a difference between a historian and a Christian. And if we do not know the forgiveness of sins and Christ as our Savior, in our spirit, Father, may we acknowledge that we are sinners, deserving your wrath, in need of your mercy, and that only in Jesus Christ is our sin dealt with. That by him becoming our substitute, he paid for our sins that we might be forgiven, free, cleansed, received. We pray this in Jesus' name. And Father, if there are those who do not know Christ but need help, help them to recognize that we care. We are available. We'd like to be an assistant, a servant, a help for them to truly know Christ as Savior, in whose wonderful name we pray. Amen.